lean on us. We are here for you. You matter. You are not alone. Are you feeling overwhelmed? Not sure where to turn? The National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline is there for you 24 7. Call or text 988 or chat at 988sc.org. Whether you're having an emergency or you know someone who needs support now, they can help you take the next step towards finding hope and healing. There is hope. 988sc.org. Lucky Land Casino asking people what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kids' PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Welcome, friends. It's the Movie Boom Podcast. Jackie and Brian are talking about the movie, the movie the podcast on the radio. Welcome to a movie film commentary track. I am Zachy Hassan. And I'm Brian Hall. Hey, what's up? Yeah, not much. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a lovely Sunday morning uh, where I am sitting. How, how, how are things where you are? I would agree. I have this big window open and I'm enjoying looking at the outside world. Although I'm enjoying being inside because it's quite hot. So is, is there a, a bit of a heat wave in SoCal right now? Yeah, yeah, it's been, I tried reading on my roof the other day and it was so yeah. hot I had to go back inside. Yeah, for you? Uh, it's okay right now, but but I mean, if you follow the news, the earth is slowly being engulfed by just uh, white hot flame. Right, so uh, just better get used to it. Uh, yeah, that's... that's or, much- or maybe we could uh, try to stop it. <laughs> There's that too. We We could. <laughs> Yeah. Or I'm going to throw this out. I say you and I watch Lethal Weapon. I was going to say, this is the perfect uh, antidote. Now we get to <laughs> cool off inside with my bestest bud watching a buddy movie. Uh, yeah, I, I had a, a, a lot of fun. This is a movie I've seen many, many times. But as we say sometimes on these commentaries, when we sit down to watch them with a commentary minded eye, you know, you're almost watching it again for the first time, which uh, I had a great time doing with this. Well, this is, I think as long as you have known me, you have known my love of the Lethal Weapon films. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I, I've i always enjoyed these movies, but I definitely associate you and Sean with these movies. <laughs> uh, I, I have uh, I, I really, for for uh, almost as long as I can remember, I've been a fan of these. Uh, uh, and uh, I have so many thoughts on this. And I remember ever since we started doing commentaries, this was another one on my list of like, yeah, we're going to get there one day mm-hmm. and that's going to be a lot of fun. Yep. So uh, this year marks the 35th anniversary of lethal weapon. It turned uh-huh. 35 last March. And I thought, Hey, let's, uh, you know, wh- when we get to it, we'll have, ha- we'll have the chance. Let's, uh, let's talk through certainly one of my favorite eighties movies and, and one that I suspect many of our listeners enjoy as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, let's just see what happens. So, so um, we are queued up with the theatrical cut of Lethal Weapon. Now, there is a director's cut, and I should put the word "directors" in quote <laughs> because uh, it, this was uh, put out in the late '90s on first on VHS, and I think they did on DVD as well. Uh, but for one, two, and three, they released uh, these director's cuts that Richard Donner himself has said he does not consider his director's cut. He considers right. the theatrical versions his cuts. Right. So as a result, I say, well, I'm certainly not going to argue with Dick Donner. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, if this is the version he wants us to watch, then that's the one we will watch. <laughs> so uh, we're going to give uh, everybody listening an opportunity to pull out their, their DVDs or Blu-rays, uh, whatever they feel like watching. Uh, let's take a short break, and then we'll come back, and we will watch The Weapon. Lean on us. We are here for you. You matter. You are not alone. Are you feeling overwhelmed? Not sure where to turn? 
The National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline is there for you 24-7. Call or text 988 or chat at 988sc.org. Whether you're having an emergency or you know someone who needs support now, they can help you take the next step towards finding hope and healing. There is hope. 988sc.org. Hey guys, it is Ryan. I'm not sure if you know this about me, but I'm a bit of a fun fanatic when I can. I like to work, but I like fun too. It's a thing. And now the truth is out there. I can tell you about my favorite place to have fun. Chumba Casino. They have hundreds of social casino style games to choose from with new games released each week. You can play for free anytime, anywhere And each day brings a new chance to collect daily bonuses. So join me in the fun. Sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VTW group void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus. It is Ryan here, and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like, are you a fist pumper? A woohooer, a hand clapper, a high fiver. I kind of like the high five, but if you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. At chumbacasino.com, choose from hundreds of social casino style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly, plus free daily bonuses. So don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. DTW, void, we're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus. And we are back and ready to go. And, you know, what's funny is we're about to do the one, two, three thing, which is like a lethal weapon trope. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Although although not in this film. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, that's funny. <laughs> it started with the second one. Which number? Uh, do, I, where, where, which, yeah. Which point do you actually jump on when you're counting to three? Yeah. yeah. Is, is it one, two, three or one, two, three, go? And that yeah. in the lethal films, that's a, that's a thing that plays out right up until the very end. But yeah. uh, hey, you know, if we get to Lethal Weapon Four, which I, I hope we will at some point, right, Brian? I yeah, hope we'll, yeah, we'll make I, our way through these. I, as soon as this ended, I was ready. I was it was late, so I was tired, but I was ready to do two. So that, without exception, every time I watch Lethal Weapon, that's my. I'm like, all right, well, <laughs> let's mm-hmm. let's get it moving to the next one. You know? Yep. Uh, which I think it goes to the appeal of these films. But hey, we'll we'll talk about that. We'll watch the movie. Yeah. So if you want to watch along with us, you can. You're certainly welcome to do that. If you, like me, have have this movie continually playing on the inside of your eyelids, <laughs> then that works too. Hopefully we'll keep our conversation interesting enough. But we will uh, we will go uh, on three. So one, two, three, then play. All right. Ready to go? Ready. One, two, three, play. I thought it was interesting that they had the modern warner's logo at the beginning of this i guess i, I should say i'm watching it streaming yeah uh, that's what's on here as well you wonder if be, as they try to keep these things alive and make them feel vital and fresh like you should always be streaming this if they're like oh well, if uh, you know they see an old logo they'll think it's an old movie i think warner Brothers tends to do that because even at the superman films they they update it yeah now the the uh, Jingle Bell Rock playing, that was something that Richard Donner had to fight for, especially having it coming in on the Warner Brothers logo, hmm. uh, which does situate this as a Christmas movie, although it it's not as much as, an, as singularly a Christmas movie as Die Hard, for example. Right, right. But this is a Shane Black trope that he tends to set his movies at Christmas time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Shane Black was 25 when he wrote this movie. Can you believe wow, that? wow. Yeah, and he was one of those early hotshot writers, right? That was That's uh, right. in the whole s- script uh, screenwriter is a uh, power player moment in the late eighties, early nineties, where they were getting. I think he got two hundred fifty thousand for this, but then eventually it was into the millions, right? Like, uh, yeah. Well, o- on the back of this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Right. You know, and yeah. and it's it's interesting that the movie that got made is i mean obviously it it owes its structure to to shane black but i think it got pulled pulled in uh in a lot of ways that have made the film more immortal i think shane black envisioned something a little bit more bonkers mm-hmm, mm-hmm. darker and, yeah bigger much darker. yeah like uh, rocket launchers and the hollywood sign that that's right yeah like at, at one point a heroin truck explodes and there's just there's just heroin snowing down on the citizens of los angeles and on um, christmas yeah <laughs> they 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 smartly pulled some of that stuff back i think i think what makes this movie work is that it you can get your arms around the story i mean it is it I, what i say about lethal weapon actually it's a love story 
It is. It really is. <laughs> it's and, it's, and that's why it two. succeeds is because you the relationship is so palpable and you are rooting for them to, you know, become the the bestest of buds that mm-hmm. we know they will become. You know, it's, yeah. I was I was I've seen this hundreds of times and I was still marveling at their chemistry while I was watching it. It really, I mean, it's on the page, but it's on the stage. It's the two actors. Yeah. And I want to say too, I I'd read somewhere that there was a score originally intended to go over this opening and uh, yeah, the jingle bell rock thing came later. And I, I think it works really great because it does set this tone that this movie mm-hmm. isn't super, super serious. Like, you know, yeah. like there's, there's sort of a little levity to it. However, it also is a huge juxtaposition to what we're watching right now, which yeah. almost makes it feel sort of like, Hey, this is Christmas time. Everybody's happy. Except right here, something dark's going down. Let's let's take a peek at it, right? I remember seeing this the first time, and my first reaction being like, "Oh, well, there's her chest, just like out there in front of everybody." Very very eighties, <laughs> right? Uh, maybe even in particular, Joel Silver. Like, oh, what if uh, what if we saw her, her chest? Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> so this this actress is Jackie Swanson, who uh, is she played Woody's wife on uh, Cheers, right? And, right. and uh, temporarily, we're recording this shortly after our track for Air Force One, which featured the actor who plays Woody's father-in-law on Cheers. That's right. That's right. So we're just working through the Boyd family. <laughs> <laughs> now, what I like about this this intro sequence is it, it's 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 like the teaser of a police procedural on TV. Yes, sure. This is the inciting incident. It's uh, you know it's uh, kind of sleazy and. Uh, sexy and scary and you don't know what's going on yep and it, this is the first domino that just gets the whole thing rolling it really does pull you in and you know? oh and by the way i had to point this out i never noticed this but that's a real stunt a real stunt yep. person tumbling down to the ground and they well, that used... was jackie swanson who fell that was actually her doing it oh and she was like trained i think i read that yeah yeah but but she's landing on an airbag that was painted to look like the driveway with the car below <laughs> amazing and I, I literally never noticed until I read that and watched it just now. And I'm like, because eh. when I was watching, it, I'm like, how'd they do that? She gets so close to that car. Yeah. Yeah. And Danny Glover was 40 when he made this. Wild. Yeah. <laughs> Wild. He's playing 50. He's, he's playing 50, but he was 40. Yeah. Yeah. I was, does this happen to you often, by the way? You're just sitting, chilling in the bathtub and your whole family runs in and. <laughs> it's you know water well, I, you and- I have a sit-in bathtub for the first time in my life now oh okay so i've had it close enough where it's like okay yeah i can relate to roger now right, right. <laughs> you know yeah. it's people i'm just trying to uh, try just just soaking in 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 my, my filth i guess <laughs> <laughs> see i think it'd probably be for me this version would be i'd probably have locked the door and they'd be pounding on the door like dad listen and i'd be like that tends to happen uh. too <laughs> but now, yeah yeah yeah, w- yeah yeah go ahead, go ahead. real quick this intro sequence for yeah. Riggs was not the original way he was going to be introduced um they, they they had him at a bar and he like beats up these guys at a bar and it was a it was a much it was showing him being morose and kind of what we see here but it, literally darker and and Richard Donner wanted something just visually uh, brighter and so they came mm-hmm. up with this sequence and and I think I think it's a good intro for Riggs but I also again talk about eighties where Mel Gibson's like yep here's my ass just hanging out for the world. <laughs> Not a care in the world. Well, it's a little tit for tat then, right? At, yeah. uh, for the beginning, it's like, well, we get we get the female. We also got get get the little male nudity in here too. This, this too feels very eighties. Like I don't I don't know that we would just see just like random man ass. <laughs> random man ass, <laughs> right? Which was my band back in high school, actually. <laughs> <laughs> random man ass. That's a great band name. Yeah, <laughs> playing Coachella next summer. Yeah, but no, yeah, I, I, I get it. I totally get it. Like he's he feels scruffy, potentially lovable, but like kind of a mess. Very different than just showing him like you know, kicking the tar yeah. out of some dudes. Yeah, yeah, I, and and it's interesting because because Mel Gibson, we forget, but he was a rising star. He was not a superstar right. at the time this movie came. He we was didn't know him as the quirky fella 
Well, I mean, he's had a lot of eras of ways that yeah. we viewed him. But. <laughs> there have been distinctive – oh, by the way, the, the sign, the Free South Africa and Apartheid sign, that was uh, – Richard Donner I was like, I want that on there. Yeah, uh, I love that. Because he felt he – fe- yeah, he felt very strongly about uh, voicing his discontent with what was happening in South Africa. But here's what's interesting. He got death threats. What? As a result of the anti-apartheid messages in this film. <laughs> And so he was like, wow. well, F those guys. And the entire sequel is about ending a party. Yes, that's right. That's right. Oh, so I didn't realize that there was a, a, a correlation to all of that. Yeah. Isn't that something? Wow. Interesting. <laughs> I love the through line about Trish being a shitty cook. Yeah. And, <laughs> right. and like Roger has no shame. He's just like, yeah, no, you're, you're a terrible cook. Right. <laughs> All of this stuff is so it's so interesting as a way of setting the contrast. I mean, it's again, these two characters are, are on a collision course with each other. Right, right. We know buddy movie tropes are a lot of these tropes were laid down by Lethal Weapon, but it, it gives us such a clear sense of who Roger is, just the the everyday nonsense of uh, family life, you know? You know, that's interesting because I, I I, I I was thinking about the introductions and Riggs's introduction, and now I guess there was a version, right? Because well, uh, screenwriter uh, Jeff Jeffrey Boehm, yeah, that's right, was brought on to sort of lighten up the script a bit and add more jokes. Mm-hmm. And one of the versions he pitched introducing Riggs was him on the beach and some people like harassing a dog, right? That's right. Did you read yeah. about that? And mm-hmm. so, and then basically Riggs pretends like he can psychically hear what the dog is saying. And he's like, Oh, you want me to beat the crap out of these guys? And then he beats up the guys, <laughs> takes the dog. And I was like, I can actually kind of see that. That feels very like yeah. of this film. But then on the other hand, introducing him, just beating up random people also feels very different than just seeing him sad and self-destructive. Yes. I, right? I, I think we need to see him uh, at a very low ebb. Yeah, uh, less and not taking it out on others. Yes, exactly. Although you know, it's funny because that do- psychic dog idea comes into play in the third lethal weapon um, when they're breaking into the bad guys. Uh, you know, oh wow, that's so funny. hideout. Which so, he that was fully really, wrote, that, right? Like, I mean, here yeah, he that, was, you know, doing a pass he on was Shane Black. Un- uncredited uh, rewrites on this one, but yeah, third one was him fully. Yeah. That prostitute Dixie is played by Licia Naff, who is one of these actors who was on a whole bunch of TV shows. She was in the pilot episode of The Flash. She was on Star Trek: The Next Generation. Oh wow! I think I think she became a newscaster for a little while there. Really? Yeah. So wow. she, she, this is another one of those great movies where you see a lot of people like, oh, hey, that person. You know, mm-hmm. either they're at the tail end or the front end of their career. You know? Right. Right. And thinking about it further now, in, uh, uh, you know, seeing the scene coming up at the Christmas tree lot. I mean, it's okay for him to get a little rough with those guys, right? That's right. So we can see that he is good and he is kind of reckless, but uh, it's all right to take it out on those guys. <laughs> What's interesting, too, is that there's a scene uh, that was in the uh, director's cut uh, where we we see Riggs uh, take out a sniper at a schoolyard. Right, right. And kind of the same thing where he's got his death wish and whatever, and they cut that out. Uh, for kind of the same reason because it was replaying a lot of these same beats, mm-hmm. and I think Richard Donner was very smart about that. Where uh, again, it's about pacing, right? So when he says that, the, well, he considers this the the director's cut. It's because they really they cut it very tightly. Like every mm-hmm. scene informs either the characters or or um, the broader story. Yeah, and the tone. I mean, yes. this has like I almost forget sometimes how dark this movie can get. Um, but yes. it, it it doesn't cross that line into like, ooh, this is a dark movie. Like it's it just balances all these tones so wonderfully. And I think that's, that's right. why it still feels like sort of lightning in a bottle. Yeah, I agree. Now that actor there in the red flannel, that's John Kiedis. He's the father of Anthony Kiedis from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. <laughs> yeah, isn't that wild? Yeah. I think he 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 passed away a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. I was reading um of dementia, which is Oh, Whenever I hear that, that makes me sad. Yeah. You can see the family resemblance. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think as a way, I mean, this is the first time we realize Riggs is a cop right here. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, when he shows them the badge. And and I like the, 
I like the juxtaposition of this scene in Riggs, sort of the persona he puts on versus what we saw earlier when he gets out of bed. Yeah. Um, and again, uh, you have to imagine a lot of this is Mel Gibson's own personality, you know, the totally. Three Stooges stuff and all. I mean, he, he, we know he's a big Three Stooges fan. Yeah. It's funny. I remember in the late 80s, people would say, oh, he should play Wolverine. Leave the Mel Gibson. Mm. And, and you watch this and you're like, yeah, that's why. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> this is such a funny scene too, you know, buying all the drugs. It's great. And, you know, a hundred. He's like, okay, uh, well, let's see, twenty, thirty. <laughs> like, it's, it just so wonderfully displays his personality. What's funny is how the guy's like, "You sure are crazy, son of a bitch." Which is, it's um, <laughs> like, it's such a, uh, it's like uh, that's one hell shorthand. of a pilot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, where you gotta just make sure everybody's got it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But then you got, uh, I love this too, <laughs> just rolling on the ground, you know, shooting, shooting a gun. Very, know, very it, 80s action here. Very so. 80s, yeah. A, a gunplay, I should say. Very 80s gunplay. <laughs> and these like monster squibs, you know, like. <laughs> the, the good old days. The good old days. When the F words and, and the blood packs would, would be would plentiful. Fly, uh, <laughs> let them fly. <laughs> This I I love this where he's 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 like I don't care about me just just shoot him right mm-hmm. and then he, he he gets so pissed that he just headbutts him because nobody's doing it <laughs> yeah, right. I mean that's another part of this whole story too is I mean it's it's pretty dark I mean you have a suicidal main character and that's mm-hmm. especially these days I think there'd be a lot more thought put into how delicately and respectfully it's portrayed but. Uh, I don't know. Like that's a, that's a, that's a balance, right. About how we, we see this guy and how he sees himself. And I, I just feel like this movie does a really good skillfully dances with still making this an entertaining, fun movie, watching this person get better. That's right. Yeah. You know, wait, by the way, I was like, uh, when these kids go by here on their bikes, I was picturing be like, quick, we got to get the alien to a ship. <laughs> And just have that. Different stories playing out. Yeah, and they just keep going into the trailer. <laughs> it's like it's like in Hot Shots Part Two, where um, uh, Martin Sheen from Apocalypse Now is sailing right. by. Yeah, that right. whole other movie is happening. They're overlapping narration. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah, so so in in the director's cut, there's a scene where he uh, like the commercial that's playing on the TV. He he like throws a thing at the TV and it breaks it. Hmm. So that, and then we get the scene where he buys a new TV mm. and it's like what he's watching now is his new TV and oh, it, it's all, it's all texture. It's fine. But, but yeah, it, it's ultimately not necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. You know? I was reading about how in this scene, uh, he was playing it with a, a, an actual blank in the chamber to just for him as an actor to give it that extra edge. Yeah. But I mean, can you even imagine that today? Certainly these days, absolutely right? not. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's insanely dangerous because even a blank going off at that range, you're you're toast. Yeah, as we've learned. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. But Mel Gibson's performance in this sequence is fantastic. I mean, so good. no dialogue. And attention, too. Yeah. And I love how it, it plays out against this Looney Tunes cartoon. Yes. Um, yes. This kind of, the, the sheer incongruousness of it uh, heightens the tension, really. Definitely. Yeah. All those decisions, right? I mean, that's what makes a movie a movie you're, you're still talking about 35 years later. Yeah. Because it, they, it hits you in a, in a very specific way that, uh, you know, a filmmaker understands what they're doing, but you just receive it in a different way than you would in a movie that didn't have all these decisions, you know, made huh. and you just sort of be entertained one night, not watch it again. But something like this, it just really hits you in a certain way. Well, and, and when we talk about dire- uh, the, the, the directing decisions, uh, I mean, I'm such a big fan of everything Richard Donner does in this film. And mm-hmm. I've, I celebrate his, his ability to jump uh, uh, from, uh, uh, across different tones, not, not merely from project to project, but within a single film, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and we see that really well here. But I was reading about how Leonard Nimoy was who they first yeah. offered this movie to. Isn't that wild? 
And it's, I mean, I'm sort of fascinated by that. Like, what would that have looked like, you know? I know. And and he did not do this and did Three Men and a Baby, which I even remember learning that he directed that when I was younger, going, what? Spock made Three <laughs> right. Men and a Baby? Like, That's right. You kind of forget he had this other career as a director. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and Joel Silver wanted uh, Ridley Scott. Hmm. But Warner Brothers was like, absolutely not, because they worked together on uh, Blade Runner like five years before this. Right. Uh, which ended up being a nightmarish experience for Ridley Scott and Warner Brothers. Yeah, right. But no, I mean, Richard Donner, I mean, he brings, I think what he brings to this is that there's like a little twinkle in this movie's eye. Yeah. You know, like there's a little bit of playfulness amongst all the darkness and the fun and the the everything. And I think that's what makes this movie this movie, right? Yeah. Like if it had just been sort of a straight cop, film i just don't know that it would have played the same way like this stuff look at this this moment Uh, on three and she says do it on three and the guy jumps in so really we got we get we get the one two three false start here you're right right. yeah the cops singing (laughs) silent you know that's that's another thing too i i I realized these movies really just portray the police and the police station like a a room full of knuckleheads who get the job Mm -hmm. done that's right like that's very much the tone of these four films yeah, and and one thing that I like right here, we got Steve Kahn uh, on the left as um, as the captain. We got uh, Marilyn Trainer as the psychologist, and they are the 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 the. I was going to say pieces of furniture. That sounds very dismissive. I don't mean it that way, but they're the the texture that carries forward from uh, one uh, from one movie all through the rest. Right. Yep. They don't have major roles, but they make it all feel connected. You know. Yes. Yes. Oh, real quick, by the way, this right here, where uh, uh, the captain is going into the men's room and she's about to follow him in, that's a juxtaposition of a scene in Superman the movie, where Lois Lane is going to the ladies' room and Clark Kent almost ah, follows her. Ah, how funny. I don't know if that was on purpose, but it's something I noticed. Just something that's in his vernacular, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I do have to mention, I have a Steve Kahan story. Do you remember this? Yes, yes. Oh, you have to, yeah. So at one point... Uh, <clears throat> Sean and I, and you were helping us with it, we were trying to pitch a, a cartoon. It was sort of The Simpsons meets Lethal Weapon. It was called Sucker Punch and Leroy. And it was, I wouldn't call it a satire, but it was a, a, a knowing homage to the buddy cop sort of genre. Yes. And so, and, and real quick, Brian, uh, Grand L. Bush, this actor, yeah. another one of those mainstays in the 80s. He was in Die Hard just a year later. He was yeah. in. A lot of Licensed diehard people kill two years after that. Yeah, a lot of diehard overlap in this. Could be a silver um, thing, right? And yes, and he was Balrog in the uh, Street Fighter movie. Oh, really? Anyway, go on. Anyway, well, yeah, yeah, and I love this whole interaction here too. Where <laughs> immediately Murtaugh's like, "That guy's suspicious. Get better keep an eye on him." <laughs> but you know what I love? It's it's the the black guy suspecting the white guy. Right, right. Which, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> Um, I, I think the juxtaposition there, which by the way, as written, uh, there was no race specified for Murtaugh. And so Richard yeah, Donald yeah. was sort of like assuming it was going to be a white guy. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And, and it was the, the casting director was like, well, Hey, how about Danny Glover? He had just been in the color purple mm-hmm. and, and, he, and Richard Donner, he said this, he's literally like, but, but he's black. Oh, really? Interesting. <laughs> and, and he talked about like his own, like, wait a minute. So what? Like. <laughs> Right, right, right. You know, now here he says, "I'm too old for this shit." He does not say, "I'm getting, I'm getting too old for yeah. this shit." This is one of those miss, uh, uh, miss, uh, you know, misconstruals. You know, yeah. Oh, yeah, and, yeah, real yeah. quick, actually, Brian. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt your story. We will get. No, back. no, no, no. I was just say like, "I am your father," and yeah. Right here, he says, "I heard about your stunt, your stunt yesterday. Pretty heroic." He's talking about rigs, right? Yeah. Now, in the context of the film that we see, it's in reference to the the Christmas tree thing. Right. But when you think about it, well, that's not really heroic. Right. right? A little little uh, loose cannon E. Yeah. So yeah. it's actually referring to the sniper incident. Right. But that got oh. cut out. Interesting. Right. Um, it's funny so when those little, little but, threads happen, but your brain ties the threads together anyway. Yeah. Isn't that funny? Like that's or those loose it threads, is. I'm trying to say, you know, where it's like you should, it, it, it does prick your mind a little bit, but then you're like, oh, well, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Like, but, it, I think that goes to, I think Donner had enough of a grasp on the story. Stuart Baird, who did the editing, they understood that we wouldn't question that. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because we're just like, yeah, okay, I guess that was heroic. You know? He survived a shootout, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And then we, real quick, we should pause for this moment right here because... Yes. <laughs> here, here it comes. He said the title! <laughs> I suppose we should register you as a lethal weapon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sorry. Steve Kahn, you're telling the story. I apologize. Yeah, Steve Kahn. He, uh, okay, so then we were uh, connected with this really talented writer, Cleve Nettles, and he had a relationship with Steve Kahn. And I don't remember what the relationship was, but uh, we were like, well, sh- we should get him to play the police chief and sort of have, you know, this tie to, uh, to, to Lethal Weapon. So we actually met with him for lunch at this diner. And I mean, He's exactly as you'd imagine him larger than life (laughs) sitting opposite us. Like, all right, tell, tell me about this thing. And then he would talk about like, yeah, well, when me and Dick go golfing in Hawaii and I'm like, oh, wow. And, uh, and then we had this moment where he kept mentioning these movies and he's, and it wasn't like um, Dirty Dozen, because I've seen Dirty Dozen, but it was like movies like that, sort of these like 60s war movies. And I, mm-hmm. I just kept not having seen them. And I was like, oh, I haven't seen it, which in hindsight, I should have just lied. But I was like, uh, oh, no, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. And then at one point he goes, who the F is this guy? <laughs> I mean, he's totally like busting my chops. But uh, that was a very memorable uh You got your chops busted by Captain Ed Murphy. Come on. Yep. yep. That's a story you get to tell. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Mitchell Ryan as uh, General McAllister. He's another one of those great, hey, that guy actors. Mm-hmm. He just passed away, I believe, earlier this year. Oh. Uh, but he had been in so many things. He was on Dharma and Greg. <laughs> like, no, really? Um, as as uh, Jen Elfman's father-in-law. And um, he's in Liar, Liar. I'm sure you're, you've seen that. Oh, I recognize him. Yeah, yeah. I just saw that a couple months ago. Yeah. yeah. Oh, funny. And he was on uh, he was on Star Trek: The Next Generation as Commander Riker's father. That's what yeah. I know him from. Now, Gary Busey Ross, here. I, I should mention, yeah. So Gary Busey has said he was his career was on the downswing. This movie saved his career, which is crazy, right? Because I mean, at one point he was nominated for an Oscar for the Buddy yeah. Holly story, and uh, and sadly. I mean, it makes me sad that we think of Gary Busey now as old, just, old, crazy just, Gary Busey. Just a but, basket of crazy, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, when he's put in front of a camera, a lot of times he does behave in a really crazy way. And I think what <laughs> some people don't realize is that he was in a really, really bad motorcycle accident and suffered some brain damage. No so no. knowing that, I yeah. almost feel bad when he's trotted out and people are like, oh, yeah, what's he going to say shame. now? I'm like, I don't, maybe we should just leave him alone. Yeah, right? Yeah. But uh, the accident this was of... after this. It was 1988. Oh, no kidding. Okay. Yeah, wow. it's pretty shortly after this. Gary Busey, by the way, was in Predator 2 in 1990 right. alongside uh, Danny Glover. Right, right. Yeah. And Steve Kahn, actually. Steve Kahn is in that, too. Oh, interesting. Oh, yeah. I, man, I've only seen that like a couple times. I've seen the first yeah. one a ton of times. So this guy, Ed O'Ross, he's another one of those guys who's just in a million different things, yeah. usually as a villain. Sure. But I just like, you guys are out there like, like freaking Pluto, man. <laughs> yeah, that's so good. Which is funny because I've heard probably like you and Sean quote that. And I always assume it's a Bill Paxton line. Oh, sure. It's how he is. It's like Bill Paxton yeah. would say. <laughs> that actor was uh, in the Men in Black animated series. He was the voice of Agent K. Huh. Wow. <laughs> And as I understand it, in earlier drafts, the darker drafts, there was going to be a lot more about Riggs and Murtaugh's time in Vietnam. That's right, yeah. Like, they both had experience in Vietnam, had flashbacks. They had sort of uh, dark stories each. Yeah, which I think it's smart that they left that out, you know, Mm -hmm. because I don't think you need it. I mean, Vietnam certainly was recent enough at this stage Mm -hmm. where the dialogue gives us what we need you know when we have a scene later where Riggs is talking about um you know his like all he knows how to do is kill or thing i mean like that that gives us what we need especially with with sort of how gibson sells it you know yeah like i i like the idea that vietnam obviously and and these guys uh, Riggs is so mel gibson was 30 when he made this but Riggs is 38 right so Story-wise, there's 12 years of difference between Riggs and Murtaugh, right? Mm-hmm. And when you think about it, like even though they both fought in Vietnam, they would have 
come in at different stages of the war. Right. And it's like Murtaugh has had more time to adjust back and find normalcy. Mm. Yeah. And Cause I mean, while, the war ended in 75 and this is 87, right? So, I yeah, mean, so yeah, it's, still, it's interesting how that war looms over the story of this. Yeah. Right. And, and it, without needing to be really explicitly hammered home, like this is not first blood or something, you know? <laughs> right, 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 right. You know? And yet, I mean, when you think about it, in terms of, of 80s storytelling, Vietnam was very much, I mean, a lot of these 80s films, it was just it was just part of the backstory for many, many characters, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know? This actor, Tom Atkins, he, he was in, I mean, he's another one of these guys, he's, you know, he's in Escape from New York and you name it, but I remember him from Halloween 3, The Season of the Witch. <laughs> which is the, the one, one that doesn't have Michael Myers, right? That's right. It's the non Michael Myers one. He's the main ma- main character in that. Yeah, Mel Gibson when he did this, it's funny because uh, before Mel Gibson, they offered it to Bruce Willis, who turned it down. Hmm. And pre Die Hard, pre Die Hard, and you can yeah. kind of see that. You can kind of see the version of this with Bruce Willis, right? Yeah. Yeah, yes. And right. and and uh Shane Black wanted William Hurt. Yes, that's right. So it sort William of shows Hurt, yeah. you uh, what right, real quick the different right, lost lost boys in the back there. Um executive produced by Richard Donner came out the same year. So he's like, uh, hey, yeah, at the Wiltern. <laughs> I was there uh, right before the pandemic hit, March 2020. I saw Pee Wee's Big Adventure there with Paul Rubens doing a Q&A afterward. Real quick, real quick, look at this. Look at the people in the car behind them. Yes. They are looking right at the camera. They're like, what the heck is going on? <laughs> right? I know. Um, no, but but you, uh, what you mentioned about it actually being shot on location, I, don't you just love that? The sheer, the LA-ness of it. Oh, man. Every moment, I was like, I know where that is. I know where that yeah. is. I know where that. Like, I was like, I was just at that restaurant like two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, I mean, it. you can't fake it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's sort of like you know, um, uh, I'm I'm going through a Law and Order with with my oldest son, and one thing about that show is they shoot it on the streets of New York, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and we last year we watched NYPD Blue, which is a fantastic show. I love it to pieces, but that was shot in L.A. on uh, the Fox lot. Right, right. And you can you just know the difference, you know? Hmm. I mean, this block that looks like a city block. Right. Right. It does. Yeah. Which is funny though, because uh, Murtaugh's house is on a lot. Yes, Th- that's on but the it, Warner Brothers lot. Yeah, the Warner Brothers ranch, and uh, I've actually been there. Sean and I had a pitch meeting there, wow. and we walked down that street, and right next to it is the Griswold house. <laughs> How funny! Wow, isn't that crazy? They're neighbors, that's and if funny. there's a reverse shot from their front lawn, and behind the whole patch of trees is the mm-hmm. fountain from Friends. Yes, I, I read that. Yeah, that's right. Although it's uh, been torn down and it's being turned into, I don't know. Those bastards. They have no, no concept of history. These sons I know. of bitches. Makes me sad. <laughs> <laughs> now we're talking about casting. Uh, in addition to, to Bruce Willis, uh, Christopher Reeve had been offered this role. It's so interesting. I mean, so many different takes. Yeah. Right. Like he, t- he turned it down. Yeah. But you can totally imagine him doing something interesting. I mean, it would have been not this, obviously. Yeah. But I have no problem imagining Christopher Reeve as, as Riggs, you know? Sure. Yeah. Although I'll say there's something shorter and scruffy about Mel Gibson that just kind of works, you know? Because, I mean, he's Christopher Reeve is so barrel-chested. and That's true. That's a good point. I, I mean, love this I, guy, I by think, the way. Uh, the, oh, the <laughs> he's so perfect in just this <laughs> one role. Wrong? <laughs> <laughs> frantic guy. Like, he's perfect. <laughs> we're, we're on the, the, the guy who's about to jump off the building and... Uh, Mel Gibson goes out to join him. Well, I should, Riggs. <laughs> I always do that. I say like the actor's name. Anyway. <laughs> At least you're not calling him Lethal Weapon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Did Braveheart run away? Did Payback run away? <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, uh, Mel Gibson was who Richard Donner wanted, and he had offered him uh, a role in Lady Hawk, maybe the Rutger Hauer role. Uh, which he, he was unable to do. So th- he had been wanting to work with him. And it's just, it's funny how, I mean, the partnership between Mel Gibson and Richard Donner was something that carried mm. uh, off beyond just this, the, this series, you know, cause they did Maverick together. 
they did conspiracy right. theory together, you know? Yeah. Uh, it ended up being, I mean, uh, Mel Gibson has said that like, in terms of him becoming a director, Richard Donner was one of the biggest influences. Hmm. And I mean, right before Richard Donner passed, I mean, they were still talking about doing lethal weapon five. That's right. Which supposedly is still going to happen. I guess that's a conversation that may or may not uh, occur on our show. I guess we'll find out. Oh, well, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> right. Now, now was th- this, this, this was always in here or was this, an alternative to a scene of Murtaugh realizing that he's really crazy. Oh, that's a good question. Actually. I, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. I know. I know that there were several versions of that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, actually now that I think about look, it, I was quick, going to look, look at, look at the, the thing broke. Do you see that? The, the handcuff broke. Oh, I jumping. So the stunt man grabs the guy's hands to hide the, to hide that it broke. Wow. That's some quick thinking. Isn't that funny? Otherwise, wow. it would have ruined the take. Yeah. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. That'd be funny if they used the same air mattress that had the car in the driveway from the beginning. <laughs> That's right. And you're like, eh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> hey, come on. It's, uh, the day is going long. You know? Yeah. Sorry, you were saying? No, so I, was, I was reading in the script. This whole thing was different where okay. uh, Riggs's reaction is different. Where he's walking out here in the theatrical version going like, ah, ah, wasn't that fun? You know, kind of thing. Mm. But I guess in the script, he was a little bit more steely, staring off in the distance somewhere else. See, it's like we already did that. We did that with the drug dealer scene. Yep. Yep. So, you know, I think it's smart to mix it up a little bit. I, I think that's the thing, right? Like, contrasting his reaction there, where he is kind of waka waka, to this here. Yes. Yes where he's he's ready to put a bullet in his head. I think that's just so much more effective. I think that's that's what this movie again, it does it so well. It just dances between these tones. Yeah. Um like Jeffrey Boehm, I think does not get enough credit. I mean, rightly Shane Black is is the architect of this, but Jeffrey Boehm did a lot of stuff that helps make it the movie that we know. Mhm. You know. It's funny even the degrees of this scene. Yeah. I mean, if it was lit different, you know, yeah. if it was played different, it would be, it could be either like a really gritty drama or it could be played like heightened. And then you just don't buy into the actual darkness that Riggs is going through, but huh. they just nailed it. It just for yeah. the tone of this film. Put it in your mouth. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I remember on Mad TV, they had a recurring series of Riggs and Murtaugh sketches that I always found hilarious. Oh, really? Just doing like versions of this scene here, you know? I don't remember that. I have to look the that up. The two guys were very funny. Yeah. I should, they, had a, they, they had a sketch. It was like Riggs and Murtaugh open a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it's to me, it's the equivalent of like Jack and Tony go to the drive in, you know? Yes, like the, exactly. The exactly. The thing that you guys <laughs> Totally. You wow, that's so crazy. Funny. I, yeah, this is good. I'm hungry. But even down Sorry. to the, not even just, you know, sort of pulling the trigger, but, the, ba- you know, the hammer going back, but that he has to put mm. his thumb in there to stop it. Yeah, right. So good. See, this is one of those things, too. I was like, oh, I think this is right by uh, Universal Studios. It's just fun. Yeah, I would imagine nice for locations. you, this is, it's just a whole lot of that, right? For you. Yeah. Now, now, the 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 character that that Mary Ellen Trainer plays, she she becomes a foil for Riggs uh, throughout the series. Yeah, kind of and, played for comedy. Yeah, and and definitely by the end, you're kind of like, God damn, leave her alone. Like, I know, this poor <laughs> woman. I know. Yeah, he's like <laughs> pulling right, like, shit. pranks on her and stuff. Like. Yeah, it's like okay, you're you're happy now. Good. It's <laughs> just like, <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah, no, I'm pretty sure this street leads up to the entrance to the Universal Studios parking garage. Wow, how funny. Yeah, um, which uh, had a cross street that used to be called Buddy Holly Way. It isn't anymore, but going back to Gary Busey. But anyway, yeah, we wow, should talk about uh, Mary Ellen Trainer just real quick. I mean, she was such a staple, right? Yes. And she, she she passed away in 2015, but I mean, she was the mom in the Goonies. She's in Die Hard, Ghostbusters 2, Scrooge, Back to the Future 2. She's one of the police that picks up Jennifer. Um, she was married to Robert Zemeckis till uh, the year 2000. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, pretty pretty iconic and, for that era. And obviously the Goonies connection is probably why Richard Donner brought her back for this. Right. 
And and I think again, you know, having having Donner uh, behind the camera for all four, it created this connective tissue. So Captain Murphy, um, you know, uh, uh, Mary Lane Trainer's character, um, Stephanie. I don't remember her last name. The character's name. It's embarrassing. The psychiatrist. Yeah, I forget her name. Uh, yeah, I do too. Actually, <laughs> I'm. A- Stephanie Woods, that's it, Dr. Woods, that's her name. Um, But, uh, you know, and and then the the Rogers family and stuff. I mean, it makes it feel like they're all connected to each other. The films are, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, And then then, uh, uh, behind the the camera, you know, the uh, Michael Kamen doing the score for all four with Eric Clapton and David Sanborn. And this, you know, like, it's funny because, you know, I think I think Die Hard as a film is singularly good. Mm-hmm. I think Lethal Weapon as a franchise is better. Mm. Oh yeah, sure, sure, right. And, and I love the Die Hard sequels, but I think I think is the further along we get, the, it just it just becomes uh, the Bruce Willis show, right? Yeah, and and that's fine. But I th- for me, that's why I enjoy going through this series. Whereas I think with Die Hard, you can you can stop at one. <laughs> it's true and but i think speaking to everything we've said it it all feels of a piece the tone yeah. even though it gets a little bit more lighthearted as they go along right like the because it's coming from the same voices you really feel that continuity yeah. the relationship with each other and that's why it's like well i just want more of this and it's like well there's three more <laughs> you know yeah yeah well and and i think certainly with Riggs's arc i mean they wrap they wrap up his journey in this one in a satisfying way where I don't think you could keep going with that. Right. Like, sure. Like four movies in, if he's still suicidal, it's like, all right, I just like, I yeah, don't know, we need to, we need to move on here, you know? Yeah. Yeah. He has a um, progression. But yeah, we, we, I think when you go through all four and you have both the first movie and the fourth movie end with Riggs at his wife's grave, but the co- surrounding context is so different. It makes yep. you feel like you've been on a journey. You know? Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we have to point this out. This is one of the most famous things regarding Shane Black, which is his style of writing. I mean, obviously his movies are very witty, but so are his screenplays. Like the yes. action is written in such a way that it is very entertaining and most people will never, ever get to see it. And uh, one of his, the most famous examples of that is this scene where he's describing this house and it says exterior posh Beverly Hills home, the kind of house that I'll buy if this movie is a huge hit. (laughs) Oh, real quick right there. That woman looking right at them. That's Joan Severance, who was a famous uh, supermodel in that era. She was also the love interest in No Holds Barred, the movie starring. No way. (laughs) That was like the ultimate 80s sleepover movie. (laughs) Yeah. That's right. That is, I did not know that. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but in, in regards to Shane Black's uh, descriptions, I know uh, later on in the scene where there's a car accident uh, after the, the nightclub escape, the script description is like uh, the two cars trade paint. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Which supposedly, according to internet lore, uh, is what made Warner brothers fall in love with this project was That's so funny. those very lines. Like, I mean, it's, you know, it's hard and then you don't want to try to totally imitate that and then be annoying, but (laughs) there's something to be said about making right when you're trying to write a screenplay, making something that people don't want to put down. It's, it's interesting. And you can speak to this as a screenwriter, but you know, certainly what beginning screenwriters fall into the trap of often. And I, I know this because I've been asked to, you know, people send me their scripts to read is, uh, describing shots in yes. your scene descriptions, right? And and yeah. you would know that that's kind of a no-no, right? Kind of a no-no, yeah. And and unless you're directing it. Yes. And so what Shane Black did so well and intuitively is creating the shots in people's heads uh without explicitly saying, you know, you know, cr- camera cranes up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly, right? Exactly. It's pretty pretty genius. Yeah. Pretty genius. By the way, I have to to mention uh, it's only it's for us, I suppose. But our friend Blaine, um, he quotes this movie so much, and I when he says, you know, now I'm happy, I'll stand over here being happy. I'm like, oh, Blaine, Blaine says, I, I just I so associate that with Blaine. I forget it's in this movie. <laughs> Which, by the way, that's Nakatomi Plaza in the background to the left of Mercantan. yeah, it's right there. You can see pre Die Hard. It was just sitting there waiting for the perfect movie to be written about it. 
Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Yeah, that's Century City in the background. It's hard to believe there was a time pre Die Hard. It, it's it's weird seeing that building pre what it's known most known for. I, I'll admit. Yeah. In my yeah, because you've you yeah you've you've uh, been there plenty of times. I well, I worked at Fox, which is yeah. right next to that building, and I've never been in that building. I've driven past it hundreds of times but yeah it makes me sad that i never got to actually kind of pull up and go in its lobby (laughs) just scroll up like reginald bell johnson yeah exactly (laughs) i like this right here this moment here where he says i'll bet that hurt to say yeah yeah. (laughs) you'll never know but i mean again it's it's again i said before this is a love story yep and and you know the the cracks are are forming a little bit Mm -hmm. and they're they're warming up to each other and it's funny too, by the way, because because there had been like buddy cop movies before this. I mean, there was Forty Eight Hours, which mm-hmm. is clearly indebted to. Uh, there's also Running Scared, right, with Gregory Hines. So I mean, it, it, Lethal Weapon did not invent the formula, but it cemented the formula in a way where this became the archetype. I yep, I had sort of written down that very thought because I was like, we had Butch Cassidy, even like in the heat of the night, right? Mm-hmm. But like yeah. this created a new template from which many, many other things sprung forth. Like if you were to say, oh, it's like a Riggs and Murtaugh kind of thing, people get it. Yep. Yep. Right. It's a very specific buddy dynamic. Mm-hmm. I mean, we you know, after this, there there's been bad boys. Mm-hmm. Uh there's been Rush Hour. Oh yeah, Rush Hour, right? And and but they're all playing riffs on Lethal Weapon. Right. You know. Right. I mean arguably the best, in my opinion, best post Lethal Weapon buddy cop uh, movie for me is The Nice Guys. Yeah, right. Shane Black, right? Yeah. And and Kiss Kiss Bang Bang actually to some extent also Shane Black. I would love to rewatch <laughs> both of those actually. I loved right, both, but it's been a while. And Darlene Love, oh my goodness, we got to point her out. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, iconic s- singer. And uh, here, I mean, I don't know actually much about her acting. Uh, I know resume, her as but... an actor just from these. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, huge, huge, huge name in, in terms of music. Yeah, very closely associated with Phil Spector and that whole wall of That's sound right. thing. And, uh, uh, you know, Baby, Please Come Home. You know, she used to sing that every year on the David Letterman show. Mm-hmm. Um, a, a Christmas Gift for You, by the way, the album, A Christmas Gift for You from Phil Spector, Desert Island album for me. Amazing. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, wow. Okay. Yeah. It's it's every year. I Sometimes I'll even listen to it in the summer when I'm writing because it puts me in such a good mood. It it, bring, it gets me where I need to be. <laughs> so, huh. yeah, she's she's iconic and it's it's really interesting to see her here. You know, like I know her as almost two different people, right? Yeah, right, right. Yeah, all all of these actors, they they remained for for the films, right? For all four of them, mm-hmm. and, and grew so that, up. It's that, so crazy. The kids. That's exactly right. That, to me, that's kind of the cool piece of texture in these films. Is like we're we catch up with Rianne a couple of years later, and here's Nick. You know, like uh, it makes it feel like we're going on this journey with with the characters. Hmm. Yeah, and it's crazy too, by the way, that she's supposed to be sixteen, but she's actually twenty six. The actress Tracy Wolf. As Rianne. I didn't know she's supposed to be 16 in this. Wow. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. Or, or at least like high school. Right. 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 But uh, yeah, I was like, what? I actually just learned that uh, Dion from Clueless, you know, Stacy Dash was 28 yes. when she made that movie. That I did know. Yeah. yeah. Pretty wild. Yeah. Now she's like a Fox News talking head. That's right. That's right. That's quite a journey she's been on. You never know. You never know <laughs> what, what the future may hold. <laughs> <laughs> it is funny how how like they play off uh Rianne having this crush on Riggs mm-hmm. and it's just very matter of fact about it and I'm like this is kind of creepy right like yeah maybe, maybe she is I, I say 16 that was just sort of my take maybe hopefully she's a little older <laughs> <laughs> I mean he kind of toys or jokes about it but I feel like it's mostly for Murtaugh's sake like yeah no that give him a hard time <laughs> <laughs> I love this whole thing too. I, I thought when, as I was skimming through the script, I, I, I could be wrong, but I thought this scene took place in a den 
And I was like, what a right. genius choice to put it on a boat in the driveway that mm-hmm. he barely knows how to work. Like, that's just so rich. Well, and it's great because it gives the characters kind of business. Business, um, much more interesting location. Says something about personalities. Yeah, yeah. Genius. What's great is that this boat has its own arc through all four films. That's uh, right. Ultimately, yeah. Ultimately sinking in the fourth one. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> they were getting a little jumbled in my head because I remembered that scene. I forgot that was from the fourth one. Yeah. It's so weird. Like I, the lethal films are very, very specific in my mind. I could tell you exactly what is in each movie. See, that's funny because they do get a little mixed up in my mind. Yeah. Like three, three, especially as probably the one I know the least. Mm-hmm. But then when I watch it, I mean, there's so much, you know. Yeah. You know, word rigs, word Raj. That's three, right? That's uh, that's the third one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. See, you got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I this this is this is just an observation. Oh, I have. Where's People the manual? Have... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, oh, that's, hilarious. that's great writing, man. <laughs> um, People talk about Riggs having a mullet, and I will offer that he has a mullet in the second and third films. But yes. in this film, he just has unkempt, longish hair. He has a mane. Yeah. Yes. Now, now that that might seem like a weird hill to die on, but I'm very specific <laughs> about what I consider a mullet. That's funny. <laughs> Some might consider that. That's funny. So yeah, behind those trees on the right, that's where the Friends Fountain is. Wow, or, or was was yeah. All right, it's been moved. Actually, I was just recently on the Warner Brothers tour when we had a friend in town, and uh, they moved it moved over to, to the side. It's been moved to the side of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, right next to the, <laughs> the Rocky statue. Right? Yeah. No, it's on the <laughs> Warner Brothers lot proper, and you can okay. see it on the tour. I was wondering about this house too. I, you know, typically these houses are facades, but you see mm-hmm. a couple shots where they're sort of going from the the sidewalk into the house or the garage mm-hmm. into the house, and I'm like, oh, how much yeah. of this house is built? That's a that's a good question. Wow, yeah. These are the things I like to think about. <laughs> well, I, th- I think you have enough experience uh, from having worked on these things that those are valid questions. Yeah, because typically the interiors of a house are in a stage somewhere. That's right. You know, yeah. where you can control the sunlight and everything. I, I love this right Me here. Me too. <laughs> um, just again, it's it, the thawing, right? Yep. Um, but you're starting to see rigs form a connection. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and Murtaugh, uh, like he's he's yeah. kind of becoming charmed by this guy. Yeah, I love. It. And they have this little moment here, right? Yeah, chunk the, with the the can <laughs> working Where together. Uh, they right, it, it doesn't have to say it. He knows it. You know, call and response. See this here, where Riggs is talking about uh, being nineteen and and being able to take this shot, like. Do we need a flashback for that? Exactly. Right. right. No. We get it. And look at how he sells it. Look at how his performance yeah. sells it. You know? Look at hiding, a little kind of hiding behind that mm-hmm. truck. Yeah, because he's ashamed. He's like, killing's the only thing I'm good at. Yep. That's interesting because you think he might say this more boldly when he was, didn't know Murtaugh as well. But now that he is forming this connection, he's yeah, there might be a little bit more shame involved with it instead of just blurting it out to him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good, good call. Yeah, I love this here, though. But you, you play the dramatic moment against the comedic <laughs> moment. Yeah. You're like, my wife's cooking. Beat. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's so great. Yeah. <laughs> you know what's funny? As we're talking about this and the, I mean, how many action movies do you sit and talk about the acting? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And I was I was reading that Mel Gibson turned down The Fly and The Untouchables to do this yes. movie. Yeah. And it made me think of like the alternate history, where like he could have been very good in those films, but yeah. he found the role that shot him into orbit for well, mm-hmm. you know, the rest of his uh, the respected part of his career. <laughs> for, for let's say the rest of the nineties. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know. But it's like finding that role. Yeah. And and. Well, first of all, when you say he was offered the fly, you're like, how on earth could you have anybody but Jeff Goldblum in that movie? Sure, sure. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Yeah. Like, I can sort of see him in The Untouchables, although I think Kevin Costner, like, again, the right guy got that part, too. Exactly, yeah, yeah. 
but but certainly with the fly you're like well that would be an entirely different movie you know yeah yeah a whole different vibe the little um i was thinking about the 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 gift that Riggs got him the little play uh cop set you know mm-hmm. um <laughs> and i was like you remember that you used to get like those are very common at like grocery stores and things yeah, you'd it would be a toy gun. You'd buy a toy gun and yeah. handcuffs. Yeah, I was like, man, there's a time capsule right there. It's funny because I guess I don't, not having kids, I don't think about it as much. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, that was what I want. My mom would buy me caps, and my brother and I would run around the yard shooting cap guns at each yeah. other. It's crazy. I mean, now it like it, there was a while there where you even if it was a a black painted gun, it yeah. had to have the the colored cap like in the the yeah, like the tip of the gun would be orange. Right. So you know that you're not even you're not even gonna get that now. Now they have to be like neon and sci-fi looking. Yeah, yeah. They're like neon green and they shoot like discs and and things like that. Yeah, it's yeah, it's crazy. This juxtaposition here too, I I find really effective. Where yeah, her her uh, high school picture versus her presence in this video, and you sort of see on her face. Yes. The sadness, right? And I think it's extra disturbing because this actress looks so young. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, but yeah, yeah, no, it's 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 well done, like you said. With and, the, I, the and, and I think for Murtaugh, it's obviously going to be much more, it's going to hit hard, closer to home because he doesn't want something like that to happen to Rianne. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so that, I think, I think we, the fact that we, we play off of his reaction, because that's what he's imagining, you know? Yeah. This scene is hilarious. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> Murtaugh just probably had this like existential horrifying night like you're just describing. And then this <laughs> cup of coffee in his face and it's like Riggs like, hey, wake up. <laughs> what? On, He's go. like in his bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. But it's cool. Like he's, his passions are being ignited. He's like, let's go do this. <laughs> I, I had an idea. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> the boundaries are melting. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I mean, it, it, to me, it's like when you get to movie four and it's just all about Riggs clowning on Murtaugh and it's because they're such good friends, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's like no knowing that we're on that journey, you know, makes it yeah. fun. And they do it just enough, right? Like they don't go as far as four in one film, right? You That's get right. four films to do it. Yeah. This is another one of those scenes I was thinking about where like we were talking about on the boat, like they could be in their car driving, having this conversation, mm-hmm. but it's so much more yeah. interesting to have it at a firing range. And then you get the extra bit of business, like the comedy out of it. Right. Where. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's, I mean, with any script like this, what you're trying to do is convey exposition without people realizing it's exposition. Mm-hmm. And so it's sleight of hand. Where we're focusing on this, focusing on that. And and the performances carry it. The setting. I mean, all like th- look at how we're, really we're advancing the plot in significant ways here. We're showing that they're good detectives. Mm-hmm. You know that too. I love it. What was that? Nothing. Yeah, <laughs> <That's why it's laughs> <cooking. laughs> but we're also that, building character. Yep. Yep. You know, we get we get their personalities here, where they're comparing the you know their targets and how well yep. they've done. And it's funny, too, because I actually, as I was watching this last night, because I remembered, obviously, what happens next. But I was like, oh, you could cut it right here. Like, the joke Hmm. is how well he did with his first target. And you could move on to the next scene if you needed to save a minute or two. But it's just so delightful (laughs) that we get the next moment. I was was thinking exactly that. Yeah. Especially because we let it play out. We let it play out as, as all of this happens. I mean, this is... This is a good 90 seconds, whatever, you know, and they very patiently leave it all in. Mm -hmm. And we even the patience of the comedy of uh, Riggs putting the target like way, 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 way back. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I mean, this is what Richard Donner said, right? Like he, he got offered action movies after Superman. And he wasn't particularly interested in action movies. And you kind of see that because his filmography, other than Lethal, he doesn't do straight ahead action movies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, and he, he said what attracted him was it was the character stuff. It's like that's the relationships. That's what makes it interesting. Right. And I think, you know, when we look at we look at uh 
each movie relative to the one before it exponentially it gets bigger but not massively so yeah 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 they're not stopping like a rocket you know yeah right exactly it's it's not like a fast and furious situation you know exactly exactly like squaring up you know playing chicken with a submarine or something right <laughs> exactly yeah this is so funny his humming apparently this humming is from uh laughing i, I yes, saw that in right. the trivia but i yeah. I don't know the reference. Not having seen Laugh In, that was before my time. <laughs> yeah. Have a nice day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so great. <laughs> Smiley face on the target. <laughs> I love how these kids just know Dixie's a prostitute. I know. I was going to say, there's something so intriguing and sort of sad Right. about this scene you know just this is what these children live amongst yeah and they just right. know it you know and even like you know i don't know it is a sad just reality period but just their view of well, and, the and they and, take one look at them and they're like oh these guys are cops right so yep. obviously they encounter cops a lot yep they're really good and, you know and it reminded me of uh like a trope that i don't feel like we see anymore where they're like there's someone wearing 3d glasses for no good reason <laughs> Like, I mean, you know, one of Biff's cronies. Oh, this is so good. Yeah. The airplane in the background. I don't know. Yeah. Just this extra level of reality to that. I mean, he couldn't have planned that. That was just. I wonder or if they were just waiting. Because I'm sure LAX is like right there. Hmm. You know, I, I thought about that. I wonder if they, they were, were waiting, waiting for a plane and they're like, cross your fingers, get, say a prayer. Let's go. <laughs> you know? To get the plane in the shot like they wanted it. In the yeah. Shot. But yeah, it just adds this extra. I remember bringing that up in speed when the pl- or the bus is taking that hard turn and then they frame it in such a way where this police motorcycle just goes whizzoom, right in front of it. And yes, it just gives it right. this crazy kinetic energy. And yeah. I just, yeah, I miss that. Like it's, it's, it's pre-planned. It's thought out. You know, I feel like yeah. directors don't do that anymore. They just kind of capture stuff and find it in editing. But this stuff, that's ah, so good. Well, and, and the kids all feel very natural here. Very natural. Yeah. Uh, they, they avoid dumb kid syndrome. <laughs> it's true in the way that they talk and like, don't tell him and, you know, covering his mouth. It's very good kid stuff, kid, the way they interact, even the way they sort of like cozy up to them immediately mm-hmm. yeah, on that exactly. car where they're sort of touching his shoulder. And yeah, I was just thinking that. Yeah, exactly. See, but what I like here is we're gradually like the the onion. We're just peeling it, mm-hmm. you know, and we're fi- like all of this started with the dead prostitute, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then just oh, but it's because of this and this and this and and it all it the, as it grows as the plot grows. Uh, again, it's still something you can get your arms around, but it yeah. it it it, it uh, exudes out, you know, very gradually. Yep. And this bomb like this is no ordinary trigger yeah right exactly you know yeah the you know in in the scene earlier where uh they're in the boat and rianne comes up and talks about the boyfriend i thought that that's very interesting too that the boyfriend kind of becomes a plot point mm-hmm. and yet we never see the boyfriend like that was a shot they they, sh- they shot that oh interesting um they they shot a I don't know about uh, a scene earlier in the film, but definitely the scene where he is killed. They shot that, but they cut it out. Oh, is this all on the DVD or? Uh, that was not in the director's cut, but that's a deleted scene. I believe you can see it on YouTube. Okay. I think I've seen the director's cut because I do re- remember the sniper thing. and Yeah. 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 The director's cut didn't put everything back in. It it put back maybe, maybe three scenes. There was, there was a scene like after Riggs, leaves uh murtaugh's house he goes and picks up a prostitute and uh he just wants her to come watch three stooges with him right right so that was it but they cut that again that that was added for the director's cut right which is funny i mean that was such a trick in those early dvd days where it would be like this is a a director's cut and it or it'd be like unrated the unrated version and all they were doing was adding things you know, yeah. it, it didn't yeah. necessarily mean it was more salacious or something the director wanted. They just put in a scene that got cut. Yeah. You so know, and then they could be like, well, we didn't put it in front of the ratings board. So yeah. technically so it's, it's unrated. unrated. That's right. Yeah. Like, I mean, definitely like I, I think that the extended versions of these films are, are they're all fine. But I, I think Donner's instincts where he's like, well, these are 
I consider these theatrical versions the the final ones. I I think he's he's on point with that too. You know, kind of like with the Terminator Two. I think that was the first director's cut I ever saw, and it was interesting to see the additional scenes. But you're like, no, no, it it moves better the way it, it yeah. originally came out. I think so. Yeah. But yeah, the whole 3D thing, I, I think I was, I got distracted by the house exploding, but uh, one of Biff's <laughs> henchmen in the Back to the Future movie, yes. I think it's 3D. called 3D. Yeah. By the way, the the the, the boy uh, playing Alfred, he's also wearing an anti-apartheid t-shirt. So, oh, uh, is he really? Plenty, plenty of uh, anti-apartheid messages that Donner put in there. Yeah. I love that. I mean, it's, it's pretty organic, I feel. Yeah. Well, it's just hilarious to, say what to he me. Wants to say that some assholes watch this and they're like, let's send this guy death threats. Like, I know you think you're winning people over you dumbass, you know, I know. And it's, 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 it's like, how in the world could you possibly be against this message? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, the, the fact that the sequel, which got a bigger audience and put that, the, the, you know what the South African government was doing on, on blast. Mm-hmm. Like these people essentially got in their own way. Right. 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 <laughs> now this whole, uh, you know, what, what do they call themselves? The special forces thing. I mean, that was like the original title of the script, right? It was like shadow something. No, no, no. So shadow company was shadow actually company. a script that, that Shane Black wrote before this. Oh, okay. So it was an idea he had in his mind. Yeah, but it was like about the zombies and this and that. Oh, really? <laughs> it was like these military uh, company hunting down zombies, something like that. But he you know, liked but the name. I was going to say, this. I, I feel like when I learn these stories, because you look at these certain writers, or like Aaron Sorkin or Shane Black, people that are sort of held up as pillars amongst writers, and you think... Well, I don't write things as good as them, you know, or I don't come up with as great ideas or I, on my first draft of this I, rough idea I have, I, I can't write lethal weapon, but it's, it's nice knowing, well, neither did they, you yeah, know, like right. they had a bad idea first and they had a take on this movie that wasn't right. And it took writing and it took, you know, notes from people and to, to get it to this. And I think yeah. it's always important for people to remember and for myself, frankly, too. Yeah, and certainly when you look at the career that Shane Black has had, uh, again on, on the back of Lethal Weapon, you say uh, he, you know, he sure he ran with it. You know, he ran with every uh, the opportunities that w- were offered. You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, he he, I believe he he did some script polishing on Predator. Oh uh, yeah, right. Wasn't he hired for that reason? Yeah, and he's in it. He's yeah, he's Hawking, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. Meaning, like they brought him on as part of the team, but he was also so he could be there and punch which up came out script. by the way just a few months after this Predator. Yeah, yeah. Shadow Company. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about the drugs, though. Definitely, uh, you know, the eighties. That that guys. really like I I I feel like I knew far more about the ins and outs of, of the heroin trade right. than, than like a, a 10 year old should probably have known. You know? <laughs> you know? Yeah. We brought this up several, several episodes ago, but I remember, yeah, even as a child, I was recognizing this whole, like, it's all about the drugs, you know, kind of plots <laughs> all popping up in everything. And the sequel crocodile Dundee two was all about drugs. And I was like, even as a kid, I was like, really <laughs> <laughs> kind of a switch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is kind of funny too this whole eggnog is like gosh shouldn't that be in a cooler what, what's the deal with all this eggnog just sitting there on the table <laughs> he's but, just pounding it down yeah but then it's just setting it up for like a really dynamic death <laughs> a, a fun uh, uh yeah visually interesting death exactly yeah almost like a bugs bunny death you know, you're like <laughs> shot and then like you're drinking something and water comes <laughs> out of you like a, like it, a fountain. it uh yeah the, the way uh hunsacker gets taken out it's very similar uh, to uh, a death in the Manchurian Candidate, the original Manchurian Candidate. I gotta watch that. I've not seen. Oh, that. you've never seen it. Yeah. Oh well, you've got a good movie waiting for you. Yeah, yeah, I love yeah, it. Yeah, John John Frankenheimer at the sort of at the peak of his craft. Mm. 
It's funny too how Riggs is outside for this whole conversation, and later mm-hmm. when he's being tortured, like I could almost imagine a line where it's like, "They didn't even let me inside. I don't yeah, know." I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, boom. But you realize you need Riggs outside so he can get a clear uh, yes. visual of Mr. Joshua. Yeah. Now sad at this poor girl's funeral. <laughs> yeah. Right. All this melee. Sad too. This is a movie too, where you know sometimes characters they know each other, and then something goes down, and you don't care because you're just excited about the car chase that's about to happen. But I actually mm-hmm. feel sad for Murtaugh that his buddy, you know, from the yeah. from the war, you know, they obviously had a really special relationship, a connection, and then it ends with that guy getting killed and being him being like, you know, you got off easy, son of a bitch. Son like of a bitch. sad, you know, yeah. disappointing. It's interesting that that the McAllister character is sort of he 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 has a presence over the film, but he's not mm. in very much of it. You know, it's a good point. He's the guy pulling the strings. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny too. I think Lethal Weapon comes up sometimes as movies also where you see a car driving and you hear dialogue over the car which means they probably were like filling in some gaps or changing the plot a little bit the sequels Um, very much do that not so much in this one but yeah yeah i was just thinking with the helicopter there but yeah i had that exact thought yep (laughs) i had that exact thought yeah that helicopter (laughs) now i feel like and maybe I'm wrong, but it, this wouldn't be as common. Like you can just walk down a street in LA and find a street walker there. You, you know, you think that, and I will say the, the answer the, at present is yes, but this is, uh, I noticed the street signs. This is third and Sweetser. There's actually a restaurant called toast. I really like right there. Okay. And, uh, when I started as a PA in the early two thousands, there was a corner about Highland and Santa Monica where you would see people standing there. And I remember thinking like, whoa, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and then I even one time I had a, a moment where this woman, I, I pulled over for some reason. I was looking at a, a Thomas guide of all things <laughs> before GPS, you know, and um, this woman knocked on my window and said, hey, like I'm out of gas. Can you give me a ride? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's I, so crazy. And I didn't do it. And to this day, I feel bad about it, but also I just, in that specific area, I was like, I don't know. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. So, yeah, it, it's it's it changed, certainly changed over time. Yeah. Wow. It, you know, we were talking about sort of the exposition uh, that gets conveyed via, via uh, ADR over the shot of the helicopter and stuff. It definitely feels like that was used to stitch the previous scene with, with this um, where where Mr. Joshua just took a shot at Riggs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because it happens rather quickly. Yeah. And we don't even get a clear shot of Gary Busey, I don't think. Hmm. Uh, and, and it's kind of like, you, you got to be like, why are they after Riggs? Like, what's going You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that voiceover helps you stitch it together. By the way, do you know what what Cochise means? I mean, I, that's the name of a Native American. Yeah, and I don't understand like saying, it as a reference. It's just it's like saying chief. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Right. It's like, what do you think, chief? What do you think, Cochise? Oh, interesting. I I, I feel yeah. like I've heard that, but not obviously not as much anymore. But I did not know the meaning. I uh, yeah. I mean, that's that's my understanding. It's just it's as simple as that. Yeah. But yeah, like uh, w- when I saw this as a kid, I thought he was calling him coat cheese. Yeah, 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 yeah. It sounds like, yeah, it's easy, easily uh, un- understandable. Yeah, so I, I was like, oh, is that like a thing grown ups say? Like, <laughs> right. <coat> cheese? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, all the uh, spray is gone from the windshield. Oh, how funny. I mean, I normally I don't I don't care about those things, by the way, but it's just sometimes you notice it. <laughs> See, like this here, they're rushing home because oh, he must have had big pits. Oh, yes, sir. Right. And it's funny to me because that that bit of business about the boyfriend having he's got pits in his face. Like, I feel like 
you would lampshade that a little more to make this like feel more stressful. Like, you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, 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 sure. I, I agree. I agree. I definitely, this is one of those moments like I kind of forget about because mm-hmm. I think it isn't displayed as much. Like they clearly, they, I mean, we know they shot it and they cut out where Rianne gets kidnapped. And I think for the most part, like you, you go along with it because the pacing flows. But I, I feel like that would have been something where we meet the boyfriend and Riggs or something be like, "What's up with his like the pits in his face?" And R- R- Roger like, "Yeah, you can see through his head." Or, like something. Something. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. I thought this was all staged and lit really well. I thought about this. I mean, this could have, I mean, think about it. Like what's happening here on the page be, being in the house and then the phone call and everything. I mean, you can put a camera anywhere, right? But just look yeah. at these like bars between him and his wife, her on the stairs. And then there's this, you know, the shot from low when he's answering the phone and just like the lights dynamically lit from the bars on the stairs. Like it's uh-huh. just, you know, this is, this is a director who's really, it it doesn't feel like a set. No, no, but it's just, you know? it's just dynamic, yeah. you know, and, and threatening and sad and, you know, you're worried. It's really well executed. I like how Riggs doesn't say anything either. I was like waiting for him to say something. Right. But it's all like he's pr- processing. You can see uh-huh. on his face. He's like figuring out what to do, you know? Yep. Look at that. Look at that. All that, all that <laughs> in the frame, him looking at the family too. I, I almost thought I would have held on to that a little longer. Yeah, the the, the Murtaugh house really uh, takes a pounding over the course of these films. <laughs> it really does. Yeah, <laughs> it's like cursed. <laughs> it's really funny. <laughs> oh, this guy is like so proud of himself after this. I know. After he hangs up, he's like, hey. he's like "Yep, Riggs is dead." <laughs> 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 I got the same energy as like, I think he took his wallet. You know? <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> Dude, that's funny you bring that guy up from Back to the Future too, because I was watching something with Federica. I, I think it might have been like Veronica Mars or something. And I was like, whoa, who is that guy? Who is that guy? And then I, I looked up who he was and it was the, I think he took his wallet guy. And I was like, yeah, you don't wow. forget a face like that. <laughs> He's so distinctive. That's so funny. <laughs> Yeah, something the eerie about the Christmasness of this too, right? Uh, Usually it's uh, jolly. Exactly. I, I, how they're they're just bathed in this red, right? And it's yeah, like yeah. murder red because that's what they're plotting, you know? Yeah, it's like the, the illuminated Christmas tree. I mean, in another context, this could be magical, like the night before Christmas. Yeah. But here it's like his daughter's kidnapped. What are we going to do? And the Christmas yeah. lights lighting them is becomes sort of haunting. Hmm. Huh. I mean, I, I think what's interesting, I mean, we, we talk about Riggs's arc, right? But Roger, too, has an arc, right? Where I think he begins the movie mm. sort of feeling like, okay, I'm at the tail end of my career. Mm-hmm. Maybe feeling detached, you know? And I think um, Riggs sort of pulls him back into, uh, you know, feeling... Uh, empowered by this you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Really empowered and like that he he is capable yeah yeah i mean i because i think the movie does a good job of giving murtaugh his hero moments yeah oh yeah yeah Cause like we got one coming up here you know the thing with the grenade you know like like you know for example like uh the last bad boys film that was like the will smith show you know yeah and it, Martin Lawrence, who, who's funny in it, but he's he's the funny character. Mm-hmm. And and I think these film, all of them, do a good job of. I mean, it is it's a two hander, and they do they do a really good job of ensuring that it's not like Murtaugh stands back and okay, let Riggs just like yeah, them, you know? I like that. Yeah, they're I mean they're a true duo. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's encapsulated very well in the very you know at the very end of the movie when we see them shoot together but yes yeah well, um, that's so great we'll fawn over shot. that soon 
We'll, we'll get there. Look at this yeah. shot, though. I love this. Look at. This. I love the patience of this too. Mm-hmm. To I mean, they hold on the shot for a really long time because it is so interesting through those sort of heat lines. You know, the mirage quality of this limo appearing. Yep. By the way, I have to point out this is a dry lake up in Victorville, California. They specifically call it out, and it yep. gives me like chills because when I worked on the movie Mr. and Mrs. Smith, <laughs> what well, one of the few times I was ever late for something I can count maybe twice. I can, I can say I was, I was late for, for working on a movie and I was supposed to bring up a whole ton of sandwiches to set. Cause they were going to shoot out here. <laughs> and, wow. and so I went and I was, I woke, I was a little late and I was like, Oh crap. And then I called my boss. He's like, well, whatever it is, you got to be there at 10. And I was like, okay. So I went and picked up like 40 sandwiches or whatever it was <laughs> and hauled <laughs> ass up to dry Lake in Victorville, which is not close. And I, I'm not condoning this, but I drove, very fast <laughs> and i <laughs> i got up there i went to the location that looked exactly like this that's a great shot by the way and i saw a caterer and i had all these sandwiches and he goes what are you doing here and i was like what are you doing here <laughs> so it turns out <laughs> didn't need the sandwiches um <laughs> and everybody's funny. arriving they're gonna shoot this whole desert scene and like do you want to stick around and see what you know see the what we're doing today i was like no <laughs> and i just turned around and drove back <laughs> that's really funny <laughs> yeah Look at this great sweeping shot following the helicopter. I mean, there's such a, a great sense of scope. You know? Yes. They really milk this location in the best way. Yeah. Like, let's take advantage of this. We're in the middle of nowhere. Let's highlight that. Let's show it. And what's interesting, too, is that Donner did not shoot this in, uh, you know, extra widescreen. I mean, it's, yeah, it's... yeah. Which the others are. The, all the sequels are and and before this like for whatever reason i think you know maybe he felt like he felt this was a more intimate story uh, yeah more character focused but i i'm probably the sequels it's like well we're gonna have bigger stunts and things like that um but i think the aspect ratio works for this yeah i agree that's interesting you say that yeah it almost shot more like a drama than like a mm-hmm. sizzling action film that's right yeah But, you know, commenting on the shot of Riggs running with his gun and, you know, all these like overhead sweeping shots like you're calling out, it's, you know, now we would have drones and it would be so easy, right? But you think about it, it's like right. a helicopter and probably kicking up this dust and like, how low can we go where it's not dangerous, you know? <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. Very I mean, different. all that stuff they had to figure out. Yeah. Look at that. Got the grenade. Got the grenade. <laughs> See, I think, I think you know, we were talking earlier about Gary Busey being like, you know, yeah, the caricature of crazy Gary Busey. Um, and yet he, he kind of keeps this, this one, one level throughout this movie. Right. Mm. Uh, the only time he loses cool is like at the very end when he shoots out the TV in their house. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, obviously, like the way we introduced the character, remember, he's like burning his hand and he doesn't react. Right. But it makes him more menacing. Mm-hmm. You know? And he does have, I mean, he's always had this sort of menace in his eyes. Mm-hmm. And it, it works really well here, especially with the silences. Even as he's wearing like a preppy yeah, sweater. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> looks like he had to leave like a morning golf match to go do yeah it. right <laughs> exactly yeah yeah grenades I don't know man <laughs> I don't know about it mess with. <laughs> I mean it, it isn't a grenade but still yeah now, he takes yeah, this, out pretty much accuracy, everybody here doesn't he uh, except for Joshua yeah yeah anyway sorry what were you saying no, I was saying, I mean, Tracy Wolf, who plays Rianne, I mean, she did the 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 four lethal movies. Yeah. And that's basically it. Although she was uh, in an episode of Katie Keene on the CW last year or two years ago. Oh. Hmm. Um, but that was the first acting she had done since Lethal Weapon 4. Really? That's so interesting. I mean, she's good. Well, Wonder you why. have to imagine that that happened as a result of somebody involved being like, hey, I really liked her. Can we get her? Yeah, like somebody who grew up with the Lethal Weapon movies, right? Yep. Yep. It's funny how that happens. I mean, yeah, even on the shows I work at, like Puppy Dog Pals, it's like you think of the movies you like. And I think even in one episode I said, 
you know, like Stephen Tobolowski. And then they just got Stephen Tobolowski. <laughs> and I was like, wow, cool. <laughs> well, and, and, and obviously uh, Huey Lewis uh, being yes. on that show because our, our friend Sean is just that big of a Huey Lewis fan. He's been a lifelong fan and they were looking for a, a voice for a junkyard dog. And he's like, well, why not get the, the guy I've loved all my life? <laughs> and why on earth not, right? If you have the ability to do that. Yep. I actually, I, I think we've talked about this, but I, I had, there's a picture of them, you know, arms around each other in some recording studio. And I was like, he did it. Like he, he manifested this. You know? <laughs> he manifested it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so proud of him. You know, I, I, I've mentioned before how Roger Ebert is just one of those writers who yes. his turns of phrase just stay with me. And certainly that was the case with his lethal weapon review. I mean, he adored this movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, it got two thumbs up on Siskel and Ebert, but Ebert gave it four stars. And I would say, I mean, this movie opened in March, right? Which is not the, like, you'd think this is a summer movie. Yeah. And so I think that tells you what the relative expectations were for this. Right. And, and I would say probably Roger Ebert played a big role in turning it into the blockbuster that it became uh, it's, for, just from his sheer enthusiasm for it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, that was the thing that I was surprised because every where I went to read about this movie, Ebert's review came up. So mm-hmm. I think you're right. Yeah. Like, I think it really did play a big part in, I don't want to say, like legitimizing is like kind of a weird word, but you know what I mean? Like being like, no, I know Just, a lot of these movies it, come out, but this is the real deal and you should see this. Yeah. He gave it a little bit of extra gas. Mm-hmm. This is, this is from his, the, the, the review. He says, lethal weapon is another one of those bruised forearm movies. Like mm. Raiders of the Lost Ark. He says, it's a movie where you and your date grab each other's arm every four minutes and you walk out black and blue and grinning from ear to ear. Huh. <laughs> and I remember reading Bruised Forearm movie in his review, in this review. Yeah. And that's always stayed with me. Yeah. Yeah. I did, I'd, <laughs> I'd heard that expression from him. I didn't realize it came from that review. Yeah. But you, you, you can imagine that, right? Because I mean, when you get, you know, an action movie and again like they can be thrilling in different ways and you enjoy them but when i think of lethal weapon i honestly think of the characters before i think of any of the set pieces so you can imagine why that would thrill you know a person who watches a lot of movies yeah and i mean ebert said as much right he's just like i've seen i've uh, i've seen it all in terms of shootouts and things like that but it's it's the character stuff that's interesting yeah Uh, this actor as endo al leong uh, he's also in Die Hard. Yep. Yep. And Genghis Khan and Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Yep. That's right. I mean, he's a <laughs> quintessential, that guy. Kind of, kind of a mainstay of, of 80s movies. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Actually, I almost feel bad when he dies because <laughs> he, <laughs> I mean, he's willing to kill Riggs, no doubt. But he's just like, sorry, pal. Like, he actually has this weird little <laughs> moment with him. Like, sorry, I, I was, you know, it kind of sucks, but I was told to do this. <laughs> Now I feel like you know there there's a whole subgenre of Mel Gibson torture scenes. Yes, um, yes. Because because it, Mel Gibson certainly certainly plays the heck out of uh, Mel Gibson torture scenes. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> Which is funny because I I thought this was the scene where he dislocated his shoulder, and I was like, oh, that's not even in this movie. Nope. Yeah, yeah that comes later. It's in like every other Lethal Weapon that's movie. Right. But... Yeah, whether whether screaming in agony or or just stolidly. Uh, uh, enduring it, you know, he, mm-hmm. he's found every he's found every variation of of taking torture. <laughs> so true. That's really funny. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this you know this this portion of the movie, like we were saying, I mean, it isn't just a straight up comedy and it isn't just a straight up drama or this or that or whatever. But this portion gets pretty dark. It does. Yeah. You know, I mean, this torture stuff isn't fun and then you know even just sort of the the visuals of this father and daughter in this really ugly situation feel yeah less like glossy and cleaned up and we're gonna get out of here and then kill everybody and they feel really perilous and kind of uncomfortable honestly yeah and i i think they they do a good job of setting that up like i see woven throughout is this sense of um Rianne being sexualized right and so the the implication throughout i mean the the note um that's left for him is like your daughter looks very pretty naked right which they don't you kind of have to catch it 
you have to catch it right yeah um, and there's like a, but the, a polaroid yeah yeah and and it's it's you know if you remember the scene in the very beginning where she comes down in that new year's dress yes and I was like, oh, whatever he says, you know. And and so it's constantly him grappling with, oh, my, my daughter is an adult now. And yes. then we juxtapose that with Amanda Hunsaker. I mean, that's that's uh, very deliberately woven throughout. Yeah, but you know, but I wouldn't say entirely overtly, which, you know, I I'll be entirely honest. I don't know that the first several times I saw this, I even really made that connection. It was more just like his home life sort of thing. Y- y- yes. And but I I think that's really smart. You know, it's just, yeah, they, I mean, they don't, they don't, um, uh, you know, s- make it say easy it. or yeah, they don't even like directly like spell it out like they could have. Well, and, right? and even in terms of like the, the, the threat of implied violence towards Rianne is, is not, uh, sensationalized. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like you can imagine directors very like framing it in such a way and having the camera sort of leer uh, even a little bit. Yeah, exactly. You yeah. know, yeah, it doesn't do that. Yeah. This that's interesting. The first, uh, this might've been the first time I saw somebody like get their neck snapped like that in a, in a movie. Yeah. Yeah. He definitely has like a Xena on a top energy in this movie. <laughs> that's right. Cause even at the end too, he's like using his thighs to like, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> choke choke with the guy out um but yeah it's 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 interesting you say that because you can imagine a version because she's kind of in this like tank top and sort of mm-hmm. something she would sleep yeah. in let's say yes, and it's exactly. you can imagine a version where she's lit a certain way and maybe even has like sweat on her and it yep it's perilous but also slightly sexualized but i remember last yes. night like i did it just entirely this whole seeing her like this just made me entirely uncomfortable yeah which i which appreciate it should. yes it should yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly now the 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 thing coming up here where, where you know the thin oh it's anorexic uh which has been a runner throughout the movie that ends up being a runner for the rest of the series right right uh, thin <laughs> yeah thin yeah yeah and it's just funny how like you don't you don't think of that being a thing that would carry on but it's funny how as the series progressed the the stuff that became oh we got to include that like we got to have that reference you know I love that and then maybe that could only really come from the people, you know, this being the the same family putting on a show four That's times, right. you know. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Is that him? No, no. <laughs> just like <laughs> keep going. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> this guy just meeting this grizzly death. <laughs> I mean, it, it is crazy because this is our kind of our big third act action sequence, mm-hmm. and. I mean, it's as these things go, it's pretty sedate. I agree. It, it, and even yeah. in the way it's, in terms of how big it is, but also in the way it's sort of executed, you know, it's not mm-hmm. like, then you get that one VFX shot where like low and the camera static and, you know, it's just pretty grounded. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy too. There's something sort of horrifying. It reminds me of like the original Terminator where like someone just yep. enters a club and just starts mm-hmm. opening fire. Yeah, I, I was thinking about that as well. <laughs> Mr. Joshua, that bastard. You know, I was wondering also at the beginning when they're the club, you know, there's a rehearsal going on when that, the, you know, you're on Pluto, man, things going on. And there's a <laughs> band playing and the guy's like, you guys got to do a lot better than that if you're going to play here. It's just a little background business. And then I noticed yep. in this scene, there's a different band playing. I don't know if that's like a. <laughs> <laughs> that's really funny. <laughs> Now they're on Hollywood Boulevard. There's no sounds like yeah, I'm just, I, Frank. I just I love shiny city streets. Oh, nothing like it. And, and you got all the Christmas lights hanging yeah. there. Yeah. It's and that's the thing, right? I mean, these movies, you don't think about it, but they have water trucks literally standing there wetting down the street because it looks better with the lights. Yeah. Well, and and you know, I, I just I I love the old fashionedness of it hasn't been run through a million different filters. Yes. Um, yes. It, you know what I mean? So like, it doesn't look, yeah, it looks so artificial. Yeah. You know, this looks, yeah. Like, like I think there's value to that. Absolutely. You know, like, like, uh, uh, uh Michael Bay's ambulance earlier this year. Sure. Well, it depends we, on the story. And that has a specific look and I'm totally down with that. That's, that's his, that's his style. Yeah. But I, what I like is that Richard Donner, 
his his approach to Superman, which was think verisimilitude, that is just as applicable here. Mm-hmm. Just shoot, just make it look as real as possible. It's like a per, you know, it's it's perfect timing that I actually just watched Thief, Michael okay. Mann's Thief, yeah. literally last yeah. night. And when I think of heat, I think of you know really. I want stylized isn't correct, but like definitely intentional camera work and filmmaking. And it's definitely on the ground, but there's definitely kind of a style to it or, and watching thief, I was sort of surprised at how it just kind of felt point and shoot. And there was Uh interesting shots, but it wasn't super dynamic. And I was like, Oh, interesting. And then I watched lethal weapon directly afterward. And it feels like a perfect marriage of on the ground, but with some, style Mm, i think that's really well said yeah right and i which i really love that's that's probably my sweet spot honestly (laughs) well and part of it is because you got this was a formative experience you know yeah that's true Uh, you know so that kind of helps well yeah you know that that was a realization i had probably five years ago on the show where it was like my first movie was et and so I was like, oh, well, this is how movies look and sound. And therefore, every good movie should look and sound this way. You know, and you're like, if it doesn't have a John Williams score, what are we doing? What are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> Which obviously is not the case, but it definitely becomes formative for you. Yeah. Although, you know, it's funny because I, for me, I did not watch the Lethal movies until probably 94. Right. So a little later, because I because the third one had already come out on VHS, mm-hmm. and at that point, my brother and I had rented and watched the Mad Max films, all of them, mm-hmm. and I was like, "Hey, we should watch the Lethal Weapons." Mm. And and I remember watching this, and again, I had that initial reaction with the first scene, being like, "Oh, look, there, yep, there, there she is in front of God and everybody." Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> right. And and I I remember the 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 volume of f bombs was sort of like, "Wow, that's a." That's a lot of cussing. <laughs> You're right in this one. <laughs> yeah, that's probably. I must have been, you know, fourteen. Yeah, yeah. Know? Like, wow, that's a sure a lot of swearing. I don't think I didn't realize you could swear that much in a movie. You know, you, you know, it's funny. I remember the first movie where I felt that way was Reservoir Dogs. I okay. saw that in high oh, right, school, right around. There. Okay, and, and I was just like, you can do this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember having that feeling watching that at this uh, fr- friend's house and being like, is this? Can we? Is this okay? <laughs> a, a magical window has been opened this up. This is a lot. <laughs> I've never heard people speak in such a way. See, this here, so so I think it's an important bit of business, obviously, because we get Roger's hero moment. We get the neck crack thing. Love it. Uh, but we set up earlier that he is a good shot, right? That's the key thing. Yes. Like, like Riggs is like an amazing shot. Yes. But Roger is very good. He's no slouch. Yeah. I mean, he, yeah, yeah he hits the bullseye we see right. earlier. Yeah. You know, but then Riggs, as is his way, dances around it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's a really good point. I, I didn't think about that. Just showing that he's just, yeah, he's not like the guy who's too old and this is a magic shot. Like, no, he's good. I mean, it's, it's. They fit like he's peanut butter. He's jelly. Like they go yes. together. Yes. But they're both good on their own too. You know, dude, we need to make a show now called PB and J. PB and J. It was like J A Y and PB is like, you know, <laughs> Paul Bronson. <laughs> PB and J. Dude, you're just putting it out there in the world. Somebody's going to take that. <laughs> uh, go for it. I want to watch it. <laughs> I want to watch it. <laughs> That's so great. No, this is good. This is a good big action thing, but it feels warranted. Yeah, well, you you need you know what they do with with both McAllister and Joshua is you have to have the death, but you also don't want our hero directly killing them. Yes, yes, which right? is so. It's interesting when you're aware of that, watching what the writers do. Yes. Yeah. Like, like, I think that Roger, were Roger to kill McAllister, we'd go along with it because, like, well, we saw everything that that happened. Mm-hmm. But like, we still have to preserve that he's a he's uh, he's not a murderer, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Except for the Rock, you know, in Black Adam, you know, typically that's, that's... heroes don't kill people. He does. <laughs> 
<laughs> that trailer is becoming my Morbius trailer. Uh, but I, when Federica and I see it, we always turn to each other in that moment and be like, but I do. See, this, this is the advantage of going to press screenings. Oh, not um, seeing this stuff I, over and over. I just, yeah, I miss these trailers a million different times. <laughs> yeah. Which I think helps. I love all these people. It's been like raining heroin on them too, by the way. <laughs> so we got a little bit of Shane's, uh, original idea yeah, a little bit yeah <laughs> no it's funny i was just in this area we had someone visiting town and we took them to muso and frank and so it's just like wow i was just walking that sidewalk that's so cool wow thinking they're like <laughs> wow this bus flipped a car over right where, you know where i was walking mm-hmm. i feel bad for these two cops right me here. too this is kind of horrifying right i'm just like man they had they just made the they had the misfortune of being assigned here yeah and being polite, trying to help. I know. Mr. Yeah, Josh. that's funny. I thought about that too. <laughs> this is perfect. Setting up the uh, the tableau for the ending there with the the fire hydrant and. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, and and why? Because it's going to be visually interesting. But you have yep. you need you need. Yeah, to... if it's just two dudes scrapping on a lawn, it'd be one thing. But having a fire hydrant raining down water on them. Yep. Which, by the way, so you see Christmas carols playing on the TV. That's right. And Scrooged would be Donner's next movie. So you wonder if that was a little. Wow. Look at that. Yeah, because Scrooge was 88. Yeah. So he must have been like already in prep on that. Yeah. How funny. And really, in terms of the anti-apartheid messages, I mean, he made sure to prominently frame them in the shot. Yeah. it's. I mean, well, I had not noticed the kid's shirt, but you're right. Like that bumper sticker. I mean, it's you are meant to see it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. This is also one of those things I feel like you see less and less. Well, maybe now with visual effects, it's different, but where you see the actual actor in a shot oh, and yeah. then they move out of the way and then something blows up and you're like, whoa. <laughs> like, That's right. Or a car drives right behind them and you're like, whoa, they really trusted <laughs> that stunt. <laughs> but yeah, that's a good uh, visual or stunt with that car driving through the front of his house. Well, and what I like is that um, in terms of continuity from film to film, in the next movie, we've got, like, they're doing repairs on the house. Yes, right. Like, it's not just magically put together, you know? Yep. And then the repair guy, Jack McGee, is, is in the third one. He's working on Riggs' place. You know? Now he's like their best friend. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, you carry it forward, you know? Yeah. Or in this movie, it'd probably be like they're razzing each other. It's like, you take me, you take me to the cleaners. Ah, you always say that, Riggs. You know, like... <laughs> <laughs> it's a big, there's big family vibes without being yeah. called up as much or called out as much as the Fast and Furious movies, right? <laughs> that's right. Isn't that They true? only say it one time in this. They say we're family at the end. And that's Which is a mean. perfect ending. But you definitely yeah. get that vibe. There's that family vibe in yeah, these films. Absolutely. All right. I'm going to say something that's not very, might be unpopular. Not Uh-oh. crazy about this fight. On the lawn. I agree. Uh, it's so funny that you say that. I was about to be like, you know, I don't know. We're supposed to be thinking like Riggs is like this master martial artist. I'm like, I don't know. I'm not really seeing that. You know, well, there's that, but there's also, there's a complete lack of tension to this because yeah, everyone's, because everyone's standing and watching. watching. Yep. Yeah. And it's like all the cops show up and Murtaugh's like, no, no, it's fine. Just leave him alone. Leave him alone. And there's a part where they almost, dr- you know, Mr. Joshua almost drowns Riggs. And then you can see these cops in the background just drinking coffee from their thermoses <laughs> observing the show. And I'm like, I don't know. I, I don't know if there's a way to tweak this a little bit or, or something because the urgency feels gone. It's just more of like a, what do you call that with a, an exhibition, <laughs> you know? I, I, I think the idea is supposed to be that Riggs and Josh, who are sort of mirror images of each other, right? They're both special forces. Yes. And, and it's kind of like Joshua is who Riggs could become if he, you know, which I lets like his humanity go. Right. So I but, like, but I, I feel like you have to reach for that a little bit. I um, honestly had not thought about it till you brought it up. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I mean, that's a, it is probably my only note I would yeah. say on this film. Cause again, it's just sort of like, it, it feels sort of life or death, but it also can't quite feel like life or death with all these people. Slack jawed, you know, people. Well, it's watching. it's sort of it's it to me. This it's like the the fight at the end of Rocky Five, where mm, yeah, where b- it's basically over your soul, basically. But Riggs is basically like my ring's outside, you know, and then yeah. they're just like fighting. 
everybody's standing around watching. You know what I mean? That's a good point. I hadn't um, thought of that comparison, but yeah, I mean, no, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I think it's necessary in that we need, we need the Riggs versus Joshua fight. 100%. But maybe in the context of like a hostage situation. Yeah. Or even it, with this whole him drowning, I'm like, wow, that's so great. They're using mm-hmm. the environment, you know, from the, you know, the, yeah. the pools of water and stuff. But at any second he could be like, okay, okay, okay. And then Murta's like, all right. And then just shoot him you know, or something like off of him. <laughs> like just some little tweak to make yeah. this feel a twinge more dire, I think might've helped me a little bit. Yeah. But I agree. You 100% need them squaring off here. Yeah, but going back to what I was saying, like, like I, I don't buy Riggs as like a master martial artist. Sure, sure. Um, I think he's a brawler. A brawler, know? yeah, yeah, for sure. Almost like uh, Indiana Jones, right? Where you'll have to throw some dirt in the guy's face. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Roger's just like bloodthirsty now. <laughs> I can't. He got a taste, Zachy. <laughs> <laughs> it feels good. <laughs> See, it's funny because you have to have the he's not worth it. Yes. Scene. But you also have to, but he has to die. <laughs> you know, you know what I would have done? I almost would have done the same thing and him be like, no, no, Murtaugh, no. You know, mm-hmm. I need this. And then the cops mm-hmm. show up, and then it's sort of the ah. He's not worth it. Like I could have killed mm-hmm. him. Cop show up. It's not worth it. And then we get this moment. I might have right, delayed the well, cops. Look at the shot right here. Here it comes. This is like uh, right there. Look at that. Amazing. Frame that. Amazing. That's so cool. Yep. I mean, they as one. You know, as one unit, they fire together. They come together. Yep. Because because all we wanted this whole movie was for these two crazy kids to realize they love each other. Hmm. <laughs> yep. Perfectly. They literally they embrace, you know? Yep. This <laughs> Oh man. I mean like I'm feeling emotions. Like just mm-hmm. seeing them in each other's arms. I mean, it just lightning in a bottle. The casting, Actually, the I, writing, I, I, everything. Brian, you know, we haven't mentioned at all the musically the fact that they, they got Eric Clapton on guitar for right. Riggs's theme. We got David Sanborn on um on the saxophone for Roger's theme. Right, right. And then Michael came and marries it together. I mean, I mean, I don't know about you, but I can hear the Riggs music. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. As, as I'm watching this, right? Yep. Yep. You know, there was the television series a couple of years ago, which I think we both enjoyed to varying degrees. Until I went like, into very what? skeptically and then <laughs> yeah. very shocked at how much I enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah. And then it kind of went off the rails very quickly. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, Turns out Riggs and Murtaugh did not get along as well in, in our <laughs> <It> universe. <laughs> yeah, but but it's funny because the the that show, I mean, it spends a lot of time delving into the backstory with Vicky, or I forget what her name. I think Miranda is her name on the show, right? And really getting into that, and and I was, and that was fine. But I was, you know, in these films, we re, we don't see Vicky at all except in a picture, right? And yet we fully feel his angst. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and that to me tells you the, the value of, uh, you know, you don't, you don't have to show everything. You can leave things to implication. You can, you can allow nuances to emerge in performance that add richness, even if it's not explicated. Yeah. And it certainly helps. I mean, I'm just doubling down on what you said, but that we believe the performance of how he feels yeah. about this person and mm-hmm. the hurt that it's brought them. That's funny too. I hadn't thought about the parallel of one and four though at the the gravesite. Yeah. Oh, it's it's yeah. I mean, it's and and I mean, he's he's at a place here. Like this is the thing. Like if you know, originally there was a different ending here, right? Right. Uh, for 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 the first lethal weapon where they they part ways. You know, they had their adventure together and and off they go. Roger's thinking about retiring and uh, uh, Riggs is like you shouldn't, and that's kind of it, right? Mm. And that probably would have been fine. You know what right. I mean? Like if they were, you're like, oh, but then there wouldn't be sequels. It's like, well, no, you do a sequel, you figure out a way to get them back to you, yeah. whatever, you know? Yeah. It's fine. But um, if if it was just a one-off, if Riggs's arc is fully complete. Mm-hmm. So what I like is that the sequels found ways to carry forward the character while remaining true to the core of what we learn about him here. Right. And the idea that by the end of the series, 
he's full, like it, it, that grief is is never going to go away, right? He, that's the whole point of this the froggy scene with with uh, Joe Pesci. <laughs> yeah, right. I, not you're not different. Uh, you're not better than Froggy. You're just different. It's you know that's different. Yeah, it, that's Riggs' whole journey. You know. Yep. Yep. Oh my gosh, I love this movie so much, Brian. Me too. You know, I I think it is interesting. We're talking about the alternate ending where, uh, what Richard Donner realized is, not and not so much thinking about sequels, but it was like you know, the idea of them parting ways doesn't seem truthful given everything we've built up. Mm-hmm. It's about them forming a family. Yes. You know. Yes. And yeah. Him yeah, being course, invited and, in for Christmas dinner. It's yeah, exactly. Right. Where he's like, well, and I, and I love the whole, uh, you know, if you think I'm going to eat this, uh, <laughs> Christmas <laughs> roast by myself, you're crazy. And what does he say? I'm not crazy. Yeah. And right. And you believe it. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, it, it, again, it's, it's a full, it's a complete journey. And yet, as you said, this one ends and you're just like, Hey, hey let's put on the next one, man. Let's go. Mm-hmm. Right, I probably and will. What is that <laughs> today or tomorrow? Yeah, me too. Yeah, <laughs> and I certainly hope that we'll be we'll be reconvening at some point to work our way through the the remainder of these films. I, uh, I feel like that's going to happen. <laughs> you know, it's funny if we were just in the mood and we we did it tomorrow anyway, but with the plans of releasing it in a year, and we're right just. Now. But we have no idea what will happen in a year. We just keep saying all these things that do happen. We're like, well, still no signs of intelligent life out there uh, in the universe. Uh, blah, 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 blah. It's just like in the next year. Like Los Angeles has and- definitely not fallen into a sinkhole. <laughs> exactly. That, uh- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Oh, my goodness. This was a this was a delight. Yeah. And, and I mean, 35 years later. I, at least for me, you know, when I think of sort of quintessential '80s movies, mm. this is always in the conversation for me. You know, for me, you know, it's it's uh, Back to the Future and and uh, um, you know, Die Hard, Lethal Weapon, Goonies. You know, there's like that that list, ET, mm-hmm. um, of just things that I associate with that era. Even though, as I said, I didn't I didn't see uh, the films until uh, the early '90s. Mm-hmm. And yet it's still something that certainly, you know, once I saw them, I continued to watch them throughout. And I remember being so excited when they were doing uh, the fourth one, because that was the first one I got to see in the theater. Right, right. You know, uh, but, but I, I do, I tend to look at it like there's one, two, and three. And then number four is the reunion movie. Yeah. It has that vibe, doesn't it? Right. It's the very Brady Christmas. Totally. Where they're just sort of, you can tell they're happy to be with one another, kind of improvising. Yeah. Got a real, let's put it on a show vibe. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, the, you know, there has been talk uh, forever about a fifth one. And like I said, that, that I, I'm personally, I'm skeptical that ends up ever happening. Same. But we'll see, you know, if that is a, a conversation that, that ends up, uh, you know, uh, happening, it'll be on our show, on our regular show. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. But uh, otherwise, this has been our Lethal Weapon commentary track. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Brian, for doing this. Absolutely. This was great. Su- such a blast. Uh, and and we'll be back soon with our next regular show and our next commentary, whatever that is. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> uh, I, I fully expect we'll be doing a Lethal 2 commentary before too long. And please, folks, let us know your thoughts on this track. Uh, have we sparked any memories in you? What are, what are your What is your relationship with this franchise? Uh, you can you can email us at moviefilmpodcast at gmail.com and you can also hit like on our Facebook page facebook.com slash moviefilmpodcast and message us there if you like what we're doing please go to Apple Podcasts and leave a review leave a star rating every little bit helps uh, if you're looking for me you can find me on Twitter at Zachy's Corner that's Z-A-K-I-S Corner that's also my website just at com. and uh, Brian I'm sure you have uh, stuff you'd like to talk up oh yeah we uh, Puppy Dog Pals still uh, going strong on uh, Disney Disney Plus Disney Junior and uh, Young Jedi Adventures coming soon to Disney Plus in 2023 perfect well with that uh, I will put a pin on this commentary track for Lethal Weapon on behalf of my partner Brian Hall my name is Zaki Hassan thanks for listening catch you next time Lean on us. We are here for you. You matter. You are not alone. Are you feeling overwhelmed? Not sure where to turn? 
The National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline is there for you 24 7. Call or text 988 or chat at 988sc.org. Whether you're having an emergency or you know someone who needs support now, they can help you take the next step towards finding hope and healing. There is hope. 988sc.org. When you wake up well rested on a great mattress, everything becomes clear. I do have a favorite child. Things you missed when you were tired finally reveal themselves. I use memes as a coping mechanism. It's Mattress Firm's once a year sale and clearance. Get up to 60% off Select Sealy, plus a free adjustable base, all with free and fast delivery. Deals this big won't last long, so don't miss out. The right mattress matters. We'll find yours. Restrictions apply. See store or website for details.